Well, I don't know where to begin with this video, but I'm going to reveal the outcome of the entire season in the first few seconds because I'm in disbelief. Not only did we manage to win a trophy, which we haven't managed as a, as a club, sorry, for the last three seasons, I think. We won four. We won the quadruple. Winning the treble is something, something that is in theory possible, but winning the Champions League, the European Cup as well, was just incredible. And it was only around, I think, February time that I began thinking about the possibility, because I was still in the Champions League. I'd got through the group, and I'd won my first leg of my last 16 tie. I was through to the final of the League Cup against Gretna, who weren't the strongest team this season. And I was through to the, I think, quarterfinals of the fifth round of the Scottish Cup with a semi-decent draw. And I was just thinking to myself, imagine if that happens. A number of hours later, as you can see, this is where we're up to. Champions League winners, Premier League winners, Scottish Cup winners, and Scottish League Cup winners. Hands down, my most successful season in Football Manager of all time. It's not just the fact that we won four trophies, but it's the personnel involved. Let me give you an example, okay? So one of my signings was this guy, Adam Joyce. Just a standard 18-year-old, although he was 17 at the time I signed him. I managed to pick him up from Stenhouse Muir. Last season, he'd been playing second division football in Scotland. And this season, he was starting in the Champions League final against Chelsea. Played third. 40. 40 games he played this season in most competitions. He was incredible. From getting a 6.72 as Stenhouse Muir got relegated to getting a, well, 7.70 overall as he was a big part of our treble winning, uh, our quadruple winning team, I should say. And not just him, but many, many other players, some from the past, some that I, I signed this season, played a huge, huge part in this team. If we have a look at general info here, you will see that similar to my last title winning team, the average age here is very, very, very low. And in fact, a lot of my starters were actually teenagers. Many of these guys here, not all of them, but some of them, played a lot of the season. So the point is that the personnel involved was something insane as well, was something special. Another thing is, a lot of these players came from my youth setup. Now I have put into this window every single player that played at least one game, even if it was like off the subs bench. The point is, a lot of the regular starters came out of my youth academy. People like Gary Stewart, uh, who else? Martin Brown. And then there was players like Brian Nelson, who I picked up on a cheat from Rothes, a, a non-league team. This team should have been nowhere near the quadruple. But that's, I guess, the special thing about football managers. You can build these teams, build teams that, you know, are full of Scottish youngsters that have, you know, your foreign players from uh, far off lands that bring their own brand of football and players that have spent a long time in the club with little success. I, I say little success. We've won all three trophies before, you know, the, the Premier League, the Scottish Cup and the League Cup, but we've never won them all in the one season. We actually won the double when I won the league a few years ago, but this time, we've gone two better. So that is the situation. The The story of this season is quite fascinating. There's a lot of uh, little areas that are, well, in my view, quite interesting. Things that might have defined the season that I wouldn't have expected at the time. It's incredible. If this video isn't two hours long, I will be stunned. We're already, like, four or five minutes in. Let's have a look at the league. So obviously you can see I won the Champions League against Chelsea, Scottish Cup against Partick Thistle, who of course are a lower league opposition. They got relegated last season. I uh, won the League Cup against Grena, who got promoted last season. So they were uh, a top tier opposition. And then I came first in the Premier League. That is how the league table finished. So I didn't quite collect as many points as I did in 2011-12 when I last won the league. Um, but Obviously collected enough to uh, be 12 points clear of Celtic. Only four defeats. Our goals for tally dwarfs that of every other team. And just in case Celtic ever caught up with me, managed to get a plus 49 goal difference so that the league would be intact if we drew level on points. Not that that was ever in danger of happening. We should also have a look at my home form. How was my home form? Yeah, my home form was far better. If you remember last season, I came 7th in my home form. But this season, I'm right up there. Regarding my waveform, 
I'm also top. No surprise there. I actually played more home games than away games, so might have had an effect on the overall result, but you know, I, I don't think so. We uh, we only lost once at home, which was quite impressive. Scored a barrel load of goals at home. In fact, it's pretty much equal the number of goals we scored at home and away. Anyway, so that's the league. That's how the league finished. Let's have a look at the team, and more specifically, the transfers. Now, first of all, it's probably good to talk about the tactic I used, because last season I spoke about this diamond uh, formation, the 4-1-2-1-2. Uh, I downloaded it online uh, a number of seasons ago. I've used it before, but never to this extent, never had it had this much success. And I can see why it's called Dad's Diamond Delight. Props to Dad for... Uh, uploading it and for uploading it on a site which hasn't taken it down since, well, 2006, I, I'm presuming. I don't remember when I got it, uh, but I used this formation mainly. And so my idea was to go with a two up top, which had kind of worked towards the back end of last season. But what I really, really wanted to do was bring in an experienced central defender. Someone to kind of shore up the defence, because last season we leaked goals for fun. And I did that by buying a bunch of teenagers. Yeah, so let's have a look. First of all, players that left. As you can see, there's quite a lot. Most of these guys are youth players, and a lot of them have retired. Their profiles are no longer accessible. But let's have a look at the players that we sold. So Jamie McMillan, he never hit the ground at all when he was at Saints. So I sold him to Leeds for 500k. I'm not sure if that was a profit. Let's have a look. Okay, no, we made a bit of a loss in him. But he didn't play much, so we sold him to Leeds. I think that was good business. As you can see, he's not played for Leeds, so it's not as if I'm regretting my decision. I mean, we won four trophies after selling him, so I'm definitely not regretting uh, my decision to sell him. Following that, we sold Makedo, who has gone to Nuremberg for a fee of 250k. Uh, and as you can see, he's done all right but he was a player that was kind of inconsistent with me, so I was uh, looking to get him out. The other thing was, he was 181 centimetres, but his heading and his jumping was questionable, which meant he got beat in the air a few times more than I would hope. So I was glad to get him out. Uh, Richard Cooper, I should give a mention to this guy, his contract ran out, and I didn't see a place for him in the team, so I sent him off, and Clyde picked him up. But he was at the club for a fair, fair amount of time. In fact, in our title winning season as you can see he played uh, that's over 30 games he played so you know fair enough he did well for us uh, when he did play unfortunately he was surplus to requirements then we've got a bunch of youth players that have uh, been released and then we come to João Carlos one of our Brazilians who I sold at a cut price I really really regret selling him only for 500k sold him to Paris Saint-Germain the reason I sold him was halfway through the season I had to offer one of our players a contract Otherwise, I was risking losing him, and I offered him one that took me above the wage uh, budget. So I had to sell João Carlos. He wasn't playing much. He'd been out for, like, six months or something with an injury. So I thought, perfect time. Get get him out of here. And uh, I sent him off to Paris Saint-Germain. There was actually loads of clubs in for him, but he chose Paris as his uh, destination. And then some more youth players after that. So we made 1.3 million in transfers. Uh, as you can see... If we go into players in, I only spent 800000 because of my, I want to call it shrewd, transfer business. So first of all, Richard Thornton. Signed him from Falkirk, who last season I think they were in the second division, the Scottish second division. Signed him for 250000 As you can see, a decent young uh, Scottish centre-back. He can play at left-back as well, and I had played him there a few times. But he played in 43 games this season. Really good average rating. And... He's only 20, he was 90 when I signed him, so he could develop a wee bit more, I would assume, and become a really good player. I mean, he's already a good player. You're not a bad player if you win the uh, European Cup. Uh, I signed Kevin Cooper on uh, a free transfer. He was the one I had on loan last season. He never played, but it's good to have him around, especially when uh, I need a sub-goalie, because I did have a fair amount of injuries this season. Then we've got Adam Joyce who I've already spoken about, possibly one of my best signings ever from Stenhouse Muir for £10,000. He was wanted throughout the season, but he can play at right back. That's his best position. He can also play at centre back. Uh, and as you can see, he's only 18. Only 18 years old. He was 17 when I signed him. 17 for most of the season. 
and he played in 40 games this season. I actually had him in my reserve squad, but in, an injury crisis midway through the season meant I had to bring him in. And he ended up doing fantastically. 7.7 .7 average rating, 8.8 .8 in the Cups, 8.0 in Europe. Unbelievable. After that, we've got this guy, Davor Tolic. He comes from Croatia. So I signed him from Vortex. Now basically, he was uh, he was 16 at the time. So basically, if you want to sign a player from Croatia, you need a work permit. Uh, and because he was under 16, I could just offer him a contract because he, he didn't have a professional contract at the club he was at. So I offered him a, a, a contract and then I had his work permit application turned down when he accepted it. I peeled it and I got him at the second attempt. So we got a 16 year old keeper who played, well he turned 17 in December, but as you can see, 43 games, 25 clean sheets, 25, cl unbelievable legitimately clean sheet after clean sheet after clean sheet on and on and on and on and he didn't even play the like he didn't play the full season i i did play other goalkeepers at times i'm sure i think jao carlos might have played uh, in a few games let's go and have a look at that but this guy was unbelievable not this guy the guy I was on previously i'm just trying to find out how many games he played three games okay so jao carlos played in three of our games this season got a good average rating uh, but this guy played in most of our games and he was only 16 going on 17. Unbelievable. And hopefully, and he was he was capped by Croatia as well halfway through the season, but hopefully he could grow into an even better player. It's frightening to think how good he might become. Uh, I also signed this guy, Rob Baker from Charlton, halfway through the season. I figured we only had two defensive midfielders. This guy was in their under-18s team and I signed him more as a backup. He spent most of the season in the reserves. He got one game in the league and he might, in future, become a permanent starter. Hopefully he can uh, develop a wee bit more. So those are our five signings. I've actually got a few players coming in. I've got this guy here coming in from Montrose for 55000 That's a compensation because he's un he was under 16. He still is under 16, or under 17, sorry, when I signed him. Same with this guy. I'm signing this guy from uh, Aloha. Um, I'm not sure how good these guys will be, incidentally. I The reason I signed them because they looked half decent. And uh, hopefully we can get them in and uh, get them firing at all cylinders. And hopefully they can develop. But these are the five main signings. Four of which, or three of which I should say, defined the season. Uh, Davor Tolich, uh, Adam Joyce and Richard Thornton. So first of all, I should probably give a mention to the players that played some games but didn't play the full season. Uh, Steve Graham, uh, I mean, hopefully he develops. Maybe, maybe not. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Andy Allison as well. Hopefully he develops into a good player. I seem to have a lot of uh, good fortune with developing players in this save, and I've had a lot of fun with it, so hopefully these guys will develop. Uh, Rob Baker, we've already seen him, he played, got an 8.0 in his one and only start for the club. David uh, Smith is definitely, or David Smythe, Smythe or Smith? Either one. He's definitely the most exciting prospect, as you can see, and he came straight out of our academy, which is fantastic. He played in three games this season, including two in Europe. So, fair play, did alright. Uh, he uh, will hopefully play a bit more next season. My only worry is, two worries, one is natural fitness is at five, which really limits him. And second of all, in my key formation, there's no central midfielders, which is the only position he plays in. So hopefully he can uh, find a place. If not, I'm sure he'll be a good backup, hopefully. John Anderson, he has been around the team for a number of years, came out of our academy. Uh, there was one season he played a lot. He's probably going to be let go at the end of the season, unfortunately. He's he's unhappy with me. Feels like I don't rate him as a player. I do, but I just don't think we can keep... He's, he's not going to get the games, basically. We've got, like, three right-backs. So, hopefully he understands, although probably not. The final player that only played a few games was Derek Stewart. So, hopefully he can develop, because I reckon he can develop. It's a really good uh, right midfielder. He's already got amazing pace and physical attributes. Uh, he played in two games this season when we had a lack of players on the right. There's a lot of my players have low natural fitness and so they end up tired. Basically, from December through to the end of the season, we had a game Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. What with Europe, with cup competitions, with uh, things like that, with extra league games that we had to play. And so I found myself having to rotate the right midfield position. And uh, a lot of them had really low natural fitness, like... Uh, 
Well, Kevin, well, Kevin Roberts is not right midfield, but as you can see, he's got an actual fitness of five, which means he can only really play half a game sometimes, which is really, really unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, that's Derek Stewart. Then we're on to the other players. These are the, the main, this is the main squad, the core guys that played most of the season. And as you can see, right at the very top of the appearance list, with 54 games played, although that's actually not as much as Gary Stewart, but 54 games sorted by starts, Jonas Johansson. Brilliant player. One of our top performers this season. Again, 8.02. So yeah, Jonas Johansson, he's been at the club since 2007. So that's the third season, I think, that I, I had I, in this save. He's been here nine years and he played really, really well again. I played him in defensive midfield. He's 31 now. He's got two years left on his contract. I probably won't renew it, but I'm not going to sell him. I'm just going to keep him around. And I'm sure he'll play some part next season because uh, he's technically still in his peak, and we'll see how that works. Let's sort it by average rating. These are the best players. These are the players that uh, really stood out. So Jonas Johansson was one. Yaya was the other. He was the other one that got above an 8.0 overall. As you can see, he's been at the club for, well, this is his fourth season now. He had a real bounce-back story, because obviously I signed him. Only played him in 11 games for his first season. He only got two goals. Second season, he started banging them in for fun. And he got 21 in all competitions. Third season, last season, he got 35. This season, he just trumped them all. 45 goals in the season. And if you look at this, five of my players got above 10. Three got above 20. If Ryan Walker had scored one more, we'd have had four players above 20 goals in the season, which is unbelievable. And as you can see, loads of players got at least one goal. Excluding the keepers, only three outfield players didn't score, and they're all obviously defensive minded players, so this is unbelievable. They're all like full backs or defensive midfielders, positions you wouldn't generally expect goals to come from. So the, the spread of goals from this team was unbelievable, uh, and especially from the strikers and attacking midfielders who all got into double figures. Fantastic. Anyway, so Yaya, spoken about him, he did really, really well this season. Enzo Giovanni Scorza. Now this guy, this was a guy that was finished. He spent three, two years, sorry. The last two years he spent out the team. Barely played, scored handfuls of goals here and there. He was missing all his chances. This is a guy that has been with me from the very beginning. I say that, he didn't start the game in my team. I had to sign him. By signed him, he won the first division with us, and now he's European champion. Look how many goals he scored this season. 23 in all competitions. He was second top scorer in the team. He got 20 assists, which is a club record. Five man of the match awards, 7.94. Unbelievable. What a comeback story. And to be fair though, he is only 28, so it's, it's not as if he was finished. It's just I lost faith in him when I was only playing one up front. As soon as I go to two up front, he's banging them in again. After Enzo Giovanni scores, we've got the keeper, Davor Tolic, the Croatian keeper, only 17 years, 16 years for half of the season. He did really well, 25 clean sheets, only 33 conceded, 7.91 average rating, unbelievable. After him, we've got Gary Stewart. He's been at the club for his whole career, as you can see, 2008. He came into the club's academy, went out loan to Dunfermline, played here for a number of years, including in our title-winning team where he got a number of goals, 4 and 11 assists. This time, 3 goals, 15 assists, and 10 man of the match awards with a 7.89 average rating. He is an unbelievable player. I mainly play him down the left these days, and he, he does well there. Haven't really played him up front, but, I mean, fair play. He did really, really well. Then we've got this guy. This is a the other keeper who's unhappy with me because he wasn't getting a game, but how can you drop a keeper who doesn't let in goals? Surely this guy can be made to see the logic in it. Anyway, this is my Danish keeper who I signed last season. Of course, last season he played 22 games, 7 clean sheets. This time, to be fair, he got more clean sheets, or sorry, one less clean sheet in less games. So he did arguably better, 7.78. He had a big part to play, especially in the early part of the season. I think he only played one or two laterally. It's probably worth pointing out that we played 62 games, I think. I just went and counted 62 games, which is the maximum number of games we can play. Uh, well, unless you count replays. We never had a Scottish Cup replay. So if we'd had Scottish Cup replays in every single round, what would that have been? Another, what, four or five game, four games? So technically 66 is the most we could have played, but thankfully we had no cup replays and without them 62 is the maximum number. Technically 16 games, or well 18 in total, is an 
a good amount, a good number to play in a season. In any other season, that's like half the season, but it's just because we had such a fantastic season. In previous seasons, I only played, what, 40 games domestically, whereas now that number has gone way up because of the success we had in the domestic cups. Anyway, um, after Jakob Jorgensen, we have Nathan Dykes. He did very, very well this year. 19, it's his second year. And, I mean, what a player. Did very well. I know it's got a third year there, but that's just the year we signed him in. So he, he did very well. 7.73 average rating, 49 appearances, 3 goals, some of them crucial, as we shall see. Brian Nelson, he's, he only scored one goal. He was like the only fullback to score, and his goal was one of the most crucial goals. As you can see, his physicals are amazing. So he was a player. He came out of our academy. Oh, no, sorry, he was the Rothes guy. So we bought him from Rothes uh, back in the day, and then he played... Uh, for us, for our youth teams for a few years, got a single appearance there. Then he was on loan quite a bit to Morton and to Partick, and he did alright in those loan periods, and he persuaded me to bring him back. And last season he got 28 games, uh, 29 games I should say, got a good average rating. This season he topped that, 26 appearances, single goal, but 7.73. Neil Campbell's injured at the minute, unfortunately, he's going to be out for a couple of weeks. Uh, but as you can see, he came in from Alwa back in the day, at this, around the same time as uh, Brian Nelson came in. And he did, well, he did a lot of loan spells out as well, including one to Newcastle, just so I could earn a bit of money. But as you can see, last season, he played in 11 games. This season, he topped it. 29 games he played, 7.72 average rating. Unbelievable. These average ratings are frightening. Usually, you only get one or two players above 7.5. This time, we've got half the team, over half the team, above 7.5. Adam Joyce, already spoken about him, the guy from getting relegated in the second division to European Cup winner. 7.7 .7 average rating in 40 appearances, mainly at right back, but also some at centre back. Then we've got Richard Thornton, again, one of my new signings, I've spoken about him already. He's done very, very well. I should point out that um, my two centre backs, Nathan Dykes and Richard Thornton, both have high aggression. 2016. So does Adam Joyce, incidentally. Yeah, the high aggression has led to a lot of bookings and some red cards as well. In fact, I think Richard Thornton was sent off twice. Nathan Dykes was never sent off. Adam Joyce was sent off twice. I'm sure some of our other defenders were sent off. Craig Grant, yeah, so a number of our defenders were sent off due to their high aggression. I'd rather not have players sent off, but it didn't hinder us all that much, as you will see when we go through the games, eventually. Carlos, our center, central defender, he was injured, I believe, for a time, uh, but he's back. Uh, he hasn't played much, 16 games, one goal, one assist, 7.63 average rating. This is his second season after being bought from Betis. So he's probably one of the few players that's actually declined in terms of appearances and things like that, but still played a role in our quadruple winning season. Then we've got Martin Brown, as you can see, this guy, came out of our academy. He was injured recently as well for a long period of time, but he came out of our academy, one loan spell. This season, he was just magnificent. 31 uh, appearances, or 31 starts, 35 in total, four goals, 16 assists. I wish I could have played him more. Uh, he got a 7.57 average rating, 8.43 in Europe. Did fantastically well. He's just a really, really, really good player. Really good to have. Only 23. Hopefully there's more to come from him. Carl Rose. So this was a player that I signed last season uh, from lower league. This is another player that I signed from lower league English club, uh, or just another lower league club in general. He came from Rochdale in League 2, signed him, and he's got 7.45 in, how many appearances is, is that? Like almost 40. 13 assists as well, and he didn't even start a load of games. I should also point out that Nathan Dykes came from... Uh, Lower League English, yeah, Northampton, League One. So these players, they're not superstars, but they're coming from, you know, relatively lower down teams to the heights that we're at uh, at this very moment in time. Uh, following Carl Rose, we've got Cabral, player that's not really liked by other people. He's got a temperamental uh, mentality, but still, he's played in over 50 games this season and he's got over... 20, well, exactly, 20 goals, 7.4 average rating, 9 assists, 2 men of the match awards, he's unbelievable, how he's not being capped by Brazil is a complete travesty, maybe it's because of his personality, I don't know, but as you can see, some of these strikers are meh, like that guy, that guy's meh compared to Cabral, but you got to admit, like, Cabral's definitely on that level, you can't see he's not on the level of an international play uh, player, anyway, so he did really well, this is his, what, 
fourth season as well. He came in with the host of Brazilians, 3.9 million. So after Cabral, we've got Luis Rafael, a player that's been here for an unbelievable amount of time. 2009 he came, did very well last season, topped it this season. Although he didn't start as many games, but he got 7.39 average rating, 40 goals, 8 assists, 2 man of the match awards. He did very well. Ryan Walker. Ryan Walker's a player that's been around the club for a couple of years. Signed him for 1 million from Championship side Barnsley. Uh, he did score in his first season. He scored 1 goal, I should say, in Europe. He scored 5 goals last season in just 12 appearances. This season, though, he it does see he only played 27 appearances, but... He scored 19 goals in those 27 appearances. Three assists, three man of the match awards. He was a really good player to have. Nick Hill was injured for much of this season as well, but he still managed to play 12 games, two goals, four assists. As we get lower down, we're going to come to the less influential players, and he's definitely one of the less influential players, partly because of his injuries, partly because a lot of people are playing on the right wing. But he's another player that's been at the club all the way. Like He, he came out of the academy. He's one of... I think five or six players I can register in Europe that were trained at the club. Some of those I signed, obviously, when they were younger, but a few of those came through the academy like this guy. So that's that's fantastic. Uh, uh, Mick Richardson, he only played in 20 games this season. 7.25 is is all right, but he was injured for a large portion of the, the season. He got signed from a non-league English team back in the day, Radcliffe Borough. Thank you very much. And uh, from 2008 to now, he's basically played... He's been ever-present, basically. So after him, we've got David Gross. Good player. Um, he only played uh, 18 times, 19 times this season. Um, but 7.22 average rating. Got a goal, an assist, and a man of the match award as well. Only signed him last year. Uh, Colin Bell, he's been injured for a number of weeks as well. As you can see, he was mainly a sub. But that's because he plays in defensive midfield. And I prefer to start with Jonas Johansson. Uh, so he came off the bench a lot, but 7.08, the reason the rating's low is obviously because you don't have as, as much time as a substitute to make an impact, but this is his uh, fourth season, third season, sorry, and uh, probably his best by far. After that was Kevin Robertson, I know I spoke about this player a lot last season, unfortunately he was injured for much of the season, um, as was a lot of my players uh, but he still managed to make 13 appearances score three goals uh played every competition i think and well maybe not the cup competitions he only played one off the bench but 7.08 average rating for so few appearances is pretty good form in my book craig grant and i should also say kevin robertson is one of the other players who came through the academy as is craig grant he actually never had a loan period he went straight into the team in his second season so he's been here pretty much as long as Jonas Johansson and he's played very very well 25 games this season didn't get a really good average rating he was quite inconsistent as you can see by his recent form fours and fives in there we can all have a look at his form here fours fives sixes but there's a lot of sevens and eights there and a nine so fair play, he did well. Uh, David Mazio, he played in 15 games, got six goals. He's really, really good off the bench, obviously because of his height, because of his heading ability. Uh, two assists as well to his name. 6.93, so he's the first player that dips below that loose of seven. But listen, I'm happy with his contribution. Andy Jackson are happy because I, he wants a new contract. He wants to commit his future to the club. Rubbish, he wants more money. Um, although he does have me as favoured personnel, so hopefully... He'll see the error of his ways soon. As you can see, he came mainly off the bench, but that's good because he's a, a bit of a versatile player, can play in a number of positions. 6.89, but he's still, he's still got a goal, a very important goal at that, and six assists along with a Man of the Match award. Our final player is Anderson. Um, lowest average rating was 6.82, which isn't too bad. If your lowest player is 6.82, then you're doing something right. Uh, but he had five assists, one uh, goal this season. He was a player I was thinking of selling, but I just couldn't because versatility is good. He's Brazilian. I mean, what's not to love about Brazilian? I know I've sold a lot of Brazilians recently, but you know he costed me 3.7 million. I'm not just going to chuck him away. Uh, but yeah, he played in a fair amount of games. So that is all of the players that featured this season. As you can see, most of them won a Man of the Match award. Most of them got at least one assist. The only ones that didn't are goalkeepers and Kevin Robertson, but hush, hush. And loads of them got goals as well. So, like, to win a quadruple, you have to be a good team. But this was a fantastic uh, team performance. 
are definitely the best team that I've had in Football Manager. I should say uh, as well that this tactic has been edited by me slightly, mainly set pieces. I haven't tended to touch any of the uh, team instructions or player instructions, maybe once or twice in games just to alter something. Um, but mainly the set pieces I've altered in terms of you know, at throw-ins, I found myself exposed to the counter-attack, or at corners, they weren't very well set up, so, yeah, I did, I do take some credit for the goals we we scored this season, because we were quite lethal from, uh, well, certainly corners. Before we look at the games, I'm going to have a look at some of the awards, and I've not actually reached the Champions League awards yet, so what we're going to do is we're going to continue the game at the end of the video and see if we can reach the Champions League awards. As you can see, though, Jonas Johansson won Football Writers Player of the Year. Uh, he also won SPL Player of the Year. That's obviously a given. Um, Yaya was second. So fair play to the, the two of them. And that's actually Jonas Johansson's third award in a row. Which is uh, unbelievable. He's beaten Henrik Larsson's record. Well, actually, Henrik Larsson won three. But not three in a row like Jonas Johansson. Uh, goal of the season did involve us. Manager of the Year was yours truly. Second award, but it's mainly because I won the title for the second time. In terms of Manager of the Month, I, won, I managed to win it four times, which is decent. There was one month, I think, I think February I should have won it, but for whatever reason they went for Russell Slade instead. Uh, Player of the Month, uh, as you can see, Yaya, Gary Stewart uh, and Enzo Giovanni Scorza all won on at least one occasion. Gary Stewart winning it twice. Goal of the month we're not going to bother with. Team of the year. I don't think we actually won goal of the month. Could be wrong. Anyway, team of the year. There you go. As you can see, Yaya, Gary Stewart, uh, Jonas Johansson, Dykes, and Adam Joyce, and Davor Tolic all managed to win a place in the SPL team of the year. Not just a place, but a place in the starting lineup instead of being on the bench. So, fair play. Six of my players. Two, four, six. Yep. Counted that correct. Uh, top goal scorer is the main man, Yaya, 29 goals, which is interesting because that means he scored, what, 16 or 17 in other competitions, which is a vast amount. You can actually see his goal make up here. So 29 in the league, 8 in the uh, cup competitions, and 8 in Europe. So he did very well for his uh, 45 goals. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's uh, actually unbelievable. Player of the month, young player of the month, I should say. Nobody won it, which is interesting because. My team was made up of young players. This Allen guy seems to have won it a lot. Nathan Dykes, despite uh, not winning Young Player of the Month at all, he managed to come second in the Young Player of the Year. And as you can see here, uh, the St. Johnson board are delighted to have a legendary manager employed at the club. Just thought I would uh, point that out. Oh yeah, I remember at the end of the last episode I was talking about getting sacked and everything. Well... Yeah, the, the opposite of that kind of happened, so I'm happy about that. Anyway, right, here we are. Game time. What ga what happened during the games this season? Let's find out. So, pre-season friendlies. 4-0 win over Dundee to start the season off. We then drew with Bristol City. And already, in these pre-season friendlies, I'll show you the Dundee one. In these pre-season friendlies, I was already experimenting with the 4-1-2-1-2 or the 4-4-2 diamond, whichever you prefer. Although I always think the 4-4-2 diamond is the narrow diamond. Anyway, we beat Dundee 4-0, drew with Bristol City 2-2. Uh, we then beat West Ham 2-0. They're a championship side, I should point out. And we also beat Greenock Morton 4-2. I believe got promoted. Wait, no, did they get promoted? Yeah, they got promoted. So they'll be in the top division next season. On to the games. The main games, the competitive games. The season started off exactly the same as last season. Because if you remember, 2-1-1 draws started our uh, league campaign with Kilmarnock and Celtic. This time, 2-1-1 draws. This time, with Aberdeen and Rangers, two of our top four rivals for the season. If you have a look here, uh, those two teams finished in the top four. We were top, and then we did go fourth. And that goes to show that throughout the season, there was a bit of a battle until we pulled away, maybe around the 27-28 uh, the game mark. But before that... There was definitely a top four battle between Aberdeen ourselves, Celtic and Rangers. Much the same. I think that was much the same as there had been in previous years. I think. Yeah, so look, it's a similar top four. Anyway, after those two disappointing 1-1 one -one draws, in which Yaya scored and Enzo Giovanni scores are scored, we uh, came up against Sparta Prague in the Champions League qualification round. And as you can see, I was actually quite happy we got this because like, there was a lot of easier teams we could have got. But little did I know, we would end up 
winning 7-1 the first leg. Yaya opened the scoring on two minutes, uh, but they actually equalised after half an hour. Thankfully, Ryan Walker uh, hit back just two minutes later. He then added another one a minute later to make it 3-1 after 33 minutes. And in the second half, Kevin Robertson netted on 53 minutes, Yaya netted on 55 minutes. Ryan Walker scored on 81 minutes to complete his hat-trick. Of course, he got a hat-trick last season in this stage of the competition. And then Gary Stewart completed the route on 90 minutes to make it 7-1. Unbelievable. And as you can see, we are using the 4-1-2-1-2 for this particular game. We then managed to beat Airdrie United 4-1 to get our league campaign off and running. Cabral opened the scoring on 26 minutes. Kevin Robertson slotted home a penalty. Uh, and then Enzo Giovanni scores and made it 3-0 right before halftime. Nick Hill did score on 54 minutes. And uh, Airdrie hit one back on 67 minutes. As you can see, actually, Kevin Robertson missed a penalty. So... It was brave of him to go and take again, and he did score the second time, but imagine if he missed. Two penalty misses in one game would have been unfortunate. We then lost one of our few games of the year to Motherwell, 1-0 away from home, uh, so that was bad. But what was good was we then managed to beat Sparta Prague 5-0, as you can see here. So what's interesting about this game is we were 7-1 up. They had an away goal, an important away goal, because that meant they only needed to win 6-0 to progress to the next round. We managed to get an away goal ourselves through Cabral in the first minute. And then Richard Thornton got sent off and they got a penalty. So we were down to 10 men. They had a penalty. Thankfully, the penalty was missed. And then we just went on and netted another four, because why not? Cabral, eh, Carl Rose, sorry, netted on 27 minutes. Martin Brown netted on 44 minutes to make it 3-0 at half-time, 10-1 on aggregate. And then, after half-time, Carl Rose netted on 74 minutes, and then Luis Rafael completed the scoring on 84 minutes to make it 12-1 on aggregate and send us through to the group stages of the Champions League. Following that comprehensive aggregate win over Sparta Prague, we managed to beat Hamilton Academical 3-2. An interesting game. Uh, we threw away... A two-goal lead. How many times have we done that over the last few seasons? Luis Rafael netted on seven minutes. Yaya netted just after half-time on 48 minutes. Unfortunately, Chris Roberts and Paul Reid both scored for Hamilton to make it 2-2. But thankfully, cometh the man, cometh the hour. David Mazio popped up with an all-important winner. And the player who's made a name for himself coming off the bench and scoring important goals for us got another one, an important winner against Hamilton. Following that game, it was time to start our... Champions League adventure or group stage adventure as we beat Anderlecht 3-0. Yaya netted in the first minute to get us off to a fantastic start. Luis Rafael netted on 47 minutes and then Cabral scored on 68 minutes to give us a 3-0 win, a comfortable 3-0 win. Following this, we had a 1-1 draw with Inverness, in which we didn't throw away a lead. Yaya equalised on 63 minutes. And following that game against Inverness, we then beat Motherwell, got revenge against them so soon. Not in the league, though. In the League Cup third round, we managed to progress. Carl Rose netted on 14 minutes. Richard Britton, of all people, scored the equaliser in 33 minutes. I say of all people because in real life, uh, a number of years ago, we were actually going to sign him. Uh, but then he turned back on the decision. He was at Ross County at the time. And then the following season, press dubbed the St Johnston Ross County game in the top flight, the Battle of Britain or something like that. So <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, he scored against us in game here. And then Luis Rafael managed to net just before half time to restore our 2-1 advantage. Uh, or to restore one goal advantage. He then added a third on 70 minutes, by which point Motherwell were ten down to 10 men. So we beat Motherwell, then we beat Gretna in the Premier League, as you can see. Uh, Ian Lambert got Gretna off to great start. Yaya managed to equalise for us just after half-time. He then netted a penalty on 62 minutes, and then Gretna went down to 10 men to take the sting out of the encounter. Then it was back to Champions League duty, and unfortunately we threw away a lead against Maccabi Haifa. We'll go with that. Uh, an Israeli team. So as you can see, they did score after one minute. However, Luis Rafael equalised for us on 14 minutes. Uh, Yaya netted a penalty on 86 minutes, for which one of their players was sent off. And that looked like it given us a comfortable win. But then they equalised in the 90th minute. And once again, we threw away a lead 
in the dying embers of the game. It's just a done thing now, isn't it? Anyway, we played Dunfermline Athletic in the league a few days later. Uh, as you can see, people from both sides sent off. Craig Grant for us, Leon Walsh for them. Uh, Ryan Walker got us off to a good start on 8 minutes before Carl Rose made it 2-0 on 23 minutes. Uh, Dunfermline did score through Chris Ellis on 36 minutes. However, Martin Brown restored our two-goal advantage in 49 minutes uh, before Chris Ellis scored again to make it 3-2 and set up a very nervy end to the game. But we held out and uh, managed to get the three points from that game. It was then time for our second defeat of the season, I think. I think we've only lost once before this, but we lost to Arsenal in the Champions League. As you can see, Eddie Johnson scored against us uh, on 16 minutes, and that was it. Judging by the balance of play, it was pretty even, so 1-0 was probably not too undeserved. We managed to beat Celtic in our first encounter with them this season, 2-1. Cabral netted on 25 minutes before Yaya netted a penalty on 45 to give us a 2-0 advantage going to the break. Unfortunately, Peter Tomasak scored a penalty for Celtic on 65 minutes to set up a nervy end of the game. Thankfully, though, we saw it out. We then managed to beat Livingston 3-1. As you can see here, thanks to a Yaya hat-trick. Uh, Ryan Walker missed a penalty on five minutes, for which uh, Jason Brown, their goalkeeper, was sent off. They went down to ten men. Uh, they actually then took the lead, which was pretty embarrassing. But then, at half-time, Yaya made it 1-1 before netting a double in the second half to complete his hat-trick. 54 minutes, and then won four minutes from time. So another important three points of the league was followed up with yet another three points in the league. Our fifth win in a row, 2-0 win over Kilmarnock. Ryan Walker scored in the third minute and then made up for his penalty miss in the previous game to score another one to double our advantage. 2-0 against Kilmarnock, fair play. We gained revenge over Arsenal in our next Champions League group game with a 1-0 win. Obviously, we were helped out by the fact that Michael Dawson was sent off after 32 minutes. Gary Stewart scored the only goal for us on 65 minutes. Then Colo Tuni got himself sent off 7 minutes from time. And you have to say, we were worth our win. Arsenal had one shot on target. It was very much deserved. Then it was time for our League Cup quarter-final tie with Aberdeen. As you can see, we managed to win it 2-1. Carlos netted our opening goal in 14 minutes. Luis Rafael made it 2-0 before half-time. Uh, however, Ben Wilkinson uh, scored one for Aberdeen. But we still made it through to the League Cup semi-final. And about this time, all the old firm teams went out. So there was no old firm teams left. And it was at this stage of the competition I was thinking, I've got a good chance of winning this. But obviously we still have two rounds to navigate before that happened. Aberdeen paid us back for the quarter-final win with a 2-1 victory against ourselves. Carlos did get sent off. Uh, Martin Brown got our only goal of the game. Would we be affected by that? Not a chance. We managed to uh, beat Anderlecht 4-2 in Belgium. Uh, Kevin Robertson netted his last goal of the season from the... Well, not his last goal from the penalty spot, but his last goal. And it happened to be from the penalty spot after 16 minutes. Uh, Luis Rafael made it 2-0 on 41 minutes. Cabral then scored two goals right before half-time on 43 minutes and 45 minutes to make it 4-0 going into the break. Uh, right after half-time, Anderlecht scored. And then they scored again on 65 minutes uh, to cut our half-time advantage in half. But we held out for an important three points. And I think, if I remember rightly, that put us through. I don't remember. But we'll, uh, I think it did actually, because there's only one game left to go. Anyway, following that, we lost 2-0 to Rangers in the league. We got back to winning ways with a 3-2 victory over Airdrie United. Cabral opened his scoring on 15 minutes. Jonas Johansson uh, doubled our advantage on 23 minutes. Airdrie pulled one back before Cabral netted just after the half-hour mark. And then they did pull another one back on 67 minutes. Uh, but Santala was sent off four minutes from time and we enjoyed yet another three points. So at this stage of the season, uh, we were vying for that uh, top position with Aberdeen, Celtic and Rangers. Who can get to the top and stay there was the uh, the question we were asking here, and that went a lot to boost our chances. Uh, after that, we finished up our Group D games in the Champions League with a 6-0 demolishing of Haifa. Cabral netted after four minutes. Uh, Ryan Walker also scored on 28 minutes. Yaya made it 3-0 just before half-time, uh, before Cabral netted on 74 minutes to make it 4-0. Richard Thornton made it 5-0 on 86 minutes. And Ryan Walker, despite missing a penalty, scored his second 
or 90 minutes, 6 nil, unbelievable. And if I remember rightly, this is how the uh, the group finished up. Arsenal are top because they didn't throw a lead against Haifa like we did. Uh, but as you can see, 16 goals, pretty good. Only 5 conceded, uh, plus 11 goal difference. I think it's safe to say we would have been fine had we finished level on points. Anyway, that sent us through to the knockout stages once again of the Champions League. Our next game was a 5-2 win over Motherwell, who of course previously beat us in the league. Uh, as you can see... They, they took the lead this time. Phil Robinson, uh, Robson, sorry, scored a penalty on 19 minutes. Luis Rafael did equalise on 36 minutes before Cabral put us ahead before half-time. Uh, then the floodgates opened, sort of. Uh, Ryan Walker netted a penalty on 60 minutes. They made it 3-2 on 62 minutes. Luis Rafael uh, made it 4-2 on... 65 minutes however they did get a penalty and Adam Joyce was sent off with seven minutes left so picture it 4-2 Phil Robinson gets the penalty score this and it's 4-3 thankfully it was saved and uh, Cabral made it 5-2 with a minute of normal time remaining so after that game against Motherwell we then drew 2-2 with Cali Thistle and what do you know we threw away a two goal lead it's a day of the week Ryan Walker got our two goals in that game after that it was time for the Boxing Day fixture against Hamilton, easy 5-0 victory, um, made easier by the fact that one of their players was sent off 14 minutes from time, Martin Brown scored in 14 minutes, Luis Rafael made it 2-0 in 35 minutes, and then in the second half goals from Yaya on 47, Enzo scores it on the hour mark, and then Yaya scored a minute later, and that gave us our 5-0 away victory against Hamilton. Following that, it was our final game of 2015, and a one more draw with Celtic, Nathan Dykes, Managed to equalise right before half time. I was actually out of the room when that happened, so I came back to a surprise that it was 1 1 and not 1 0 Celtic. Uh, but that was good. Got a point in that game. For the first game of 2016, we thrashed Gretna 4 0. Another Yaya hat trick. Uh, he scored the opening goal in 15 minutes. Luis Rafael made it 2 0 on 21 minutes. Uh, Yaya then scored in 23 minutes and on 32 minutes. That gave us a 4 0 lead at half time. And ultimately a 4 0 win. So after beating Gretna 4 0, it was time for Scottish Cup action. We beat second division side East Fife. Uh, they did have a player sent off after 8 minutes, and it took us 38 minutes to break them down. In 32 minutes, we'd scored 4 against Motherwell. This time, it took us 38 minutes before we'd even scored 1 against East Fife. But that was fine. We got the goal. And then Enzo scores and made it 2 0, and David Mazio scored our third on 78 minutes. Following that third round Scottish Cup win, we drew 1-1 to Dunfermline. Oh, look at that. We threw away a lead against 10 men. Following that 1-1 draw against Dunfermline, we then beat Dunfermline 2-0 in the league. Ryan Walker netted on 6 minutes. David Mazio scored a penalty to make sure victory on 73. And following that, we creamed Kilmarnock 3-0. Yaya netting on 19 minutes. Scores a, a doubled advantage a few minutes later. And then Yaya netted a penalty. Uh, on 63 minutes. 3 0, easy victory. In the next game, it was another Premier League game and another clean sheet. This time, a 5 0 win over Aberdeen. Cabral scored on 6 minutes. Enzo scores a netted on 20 minutes. Uh, then Yaya made it 3 0 after 24 minutes. Cabral got his second on the error mark and Yaya netted our fifth with 11 minutes to go. It was time for League Cup semi-final action and we were against, uh, I think they were bottom of the league at the time, Dunfermline. Managed to beat them 4-0. We got really fortunate with the draw and their morale was poor. So it was an easy game. Yaya opened the scoring on 8 minutes. He netted a penalty on 40 minutes. He then scored his hat-trick on 54 minutes and David Mazio uh, completed the scoring in 84 minutes with a, another penalty. And so for the first time in about 3 or 4 years we'd made it to a Scottish uh, League Cup final, a National Cup final, which was unbelievable. It's also worth keeping in mind that we've played more Cup games in this Cup run to the final than we had done in like the past two and a half years or something like that. You know, we'd been knocked out in the first round of Cup competitions so many times that to finally uh, reach a Cup final was unbelievable. We would be facing Gretna, so tricky opposition, but not old firms, so little, uh, I was a little more at ease with the situation. Following that, we got another clean sheet and a 1-0 victory over Airdrie. Jonas Johansson got the all-important goal. I remember this game, I remember it being very difficult to break them down, but the 1-0 wins are in some ways more satisfying than the 5-0s, because that one goal 
that one moment is the key to getting the three points and Jonas Johansson provided it here. So at this point it's probably worth talking about the goalkeeper, the Croatian goalkeeper. So basically he turned, he was 16 prior to the turn of the year and then around the turn of the year he turned 17 and at that point he had six months left on his contract and what that meant was any team in the world could come and sign him. Now at this point he'd been doing all right for me, he hadn't been doing amazingly well and I thought to myself well I kind of want to keep him, I kind of want to keep him on board and I want to see what he develops into because he may develop into a world class keeper. So this was around the well, around this time here, the Celtic Gretna game. In fact, I'd offered them the contract and then we went to play Gretna. So, what happened was, one team came in with a bid for him and I asked for 20 million or something stupid because I didn't want to sell him. If someone offered me 20 million, I probably would have sold him, but, you know, nobody did. So, I wasn't going to sell him. Anyway, another team, AEK Athens, came in and offered him a contract which meant that if he accepted that, there was nothing I could do about it. So, I realised I had to act fast so what I did was I offered him four grand a week, but, because, well, I, I looked at their team and I looked at their wage policy, their wage structure, what players had the most money, how much did teenagers have, keep in mind this guy's only 17, and I figured that 4,000 a week was safe territory. But then I thought to myself, you know what, let's offer him a good incentive. I've never done this before, 4,000 a week, not 4,000 a week, sorry, 4,000 per clean sheet. So I offered him that as well. And like, what can I say? He signed this contract after the Gretna game. So I played him in the Gretna game to get him on side. You know, I'm going to play you if you if you stay around. Kept a clean sheet. So he started the next game. Kept a clean sheet. So he started the next game. Okay, he did keep a clean sheet there. But then after that, look at that. Five, what's that? Five or six clean sheets. Certainly it's about seven clean sheets in about eight games. Unbelievable. And so I was paying out 4,000. So he, he was getting 8,000 a week, technically, for his wage. In fact, technically, it was uh, 8,000 plus 4,000, because sometimes it was two games a week that he was playing and keeping a clean sheet. So 12,000 a week. You know, that's easy money if you're a good goalkeeper, which clearly he is. And I mean, listen, maybe it wasn't the money. Maybe he just, he'd, he'd got used to living in Scotland. Maybe he got used to the way the league was structured to the different teams. Uh, he was unsettled when he first moved, but he grew into his role a bit more over the season. So maybe it was nothing to do with the money. But then maybe it was. And that proved in the next game when we won 2-0 against Rangers. Okay, two of their players got sent off and we got a penalty courtesy of one of those setting offs. But yet another clean sheet. Enzo scores a netted on 41 minutes and Anderson netted a penalty on 75 minutes. And that kept a run of clean sheets going, and it kept me losing 4,000 each week. Following that, we had a, yet another clean sheet, this time in the Scottish Cup, fourth round against lower league opposition Hibernian. A Yaya netted on three minutes, he then missed a penalty, from which Enzo Giovanni scores a netted sort of a rebound, and then Enzo Giovanni scores a scored his second on 37 minutes, and Yaya uh, finally got his double nine minutes from time. So two braces there, and a place in the fifth round of the Scottish Cup. Not bad. So our amazing clean sheet record came to an end in dramatic fashion. This was one of those interesting games. This was one of those season-defining games. Let me explain. So scores have put us 1-0 up on two minutes. That's fine. What's not fine is Motherwell equalised after 12 minutes. They then went ahead on 21 minutes. All of a sudden, I've gone from having not conceded a goal in, like, stupid amount of games to, oh, I'm 2-1 down. I could actually lose here. Then, uh, Enzo scores uh, equalises on 39 minutes. Then he completes his hat-trick and puts us ahead on 45 minutes. So that's good. Everything's good and rosy. However, I mentioned uh, earlier in the video that Richard Thornton had, what was it, like 20... Yeah, 20 for aggression. He got himself sent off. What happens next? Oh, Motherwell net an equaliser. It's not looking good. It's uh, Things are not going well. But out of absolutely nothing, Nathan Dykes comes and nets a winner on 87 minutes to get at us to steal three points from this game that we didn't really deserve to win. That is absolute robbery. But... Again, season defining. You've got to win these games if you want to win the title. So the Motherwell game was just a blip. Uh, we got back to our clean sheet record with a Champions League 3-0 win over Udinese. Uh, Yaya netted on 37 minutes. Enzo scores netted on 14 minutes. And Nick Hill netted on 67 minutes. So this was obviously the uh, Champions League first knockout round, uh, first leg. 
So that puts in the driving seat. No way like uh, a way goal, I should say, conceded, but a comfortable 3 0 win. We had another clean sheet in the Scottish Cup quarter final, the fifth round, against Aberdeen. The scorers in this game were Luis Rafael on 9 minutes, David Mazio on 33 minutes. He scored from the penalty spot, and then Ryan Walker netted on 39 minutes. And that was it. That completed the scoring within 40 minutes, and we were through to the semi finals of the Scottish Cup. Following this, it was back to Premier League action and yet another clean sheet, this time against Hamilton. Uh, they did have a player set off after 32 minutes, but Cabral broke the deadlock just before half-time, and then his compatriot Yaya made it 2-0 on 63 minutes to get us a valuable three points against the team that was eventually re relegated. I should also say that Neil Hatton actually used to play for us. He came out of our academy, as you can see, he went to Wraith in the first division on loan, then he went to Hamilton for free, and heck, he, he's got his break in the top flight, fair play, but he did get sent off against us. Our next league game was against Cali Thistle, with yet another clean sheet, four clean sheets on the bounce. Uh, Enzo scores a, opened the scoring on five minutes, he then scored again on 34 minutes, and then Yaya made it 3-0 on 73 minutes to give us a comfortable 3-0 win. So I'm not sure how many games we've won on the bounce, but basically since the Dunfermline game, we'd won all those games on the bounce, only conceding three goals in the one game. We finally lost... But we won. We lost, but we won. We lost 2-1 away from home in the Champions League last 16 against Udinese. But we got the all-important away goal and didn't concede more than two. So everything worked out in the end. So Udinese scored twice on 38 minutes and on 56 minutes uh, before we managed to get an away goal on 66 minutes, which meant they had to score three goals in order to progress. So yeah, the tie was... It wasn't over, but we'd kind of put it almost out of reach at that point. So... Yeah, there you go. So that 2-1 loss, or 4-2 win on aggregate, whichever you prefer, sent us through to the quarterfinals of the Champions League for only the second time in this save. And only the second time in my managerial career. We managed to beat Celtic 1-0 in quite an interesting game. Uh, Yaya missed a penalty on 21 minutes, but he had the guts to then go and take one on 71 minutes, and he scored it, which was very important in the race for the title. Put us, I think, nine points clear of Celtic at that point, so we were very much top dog at this point. Doing very well. Very important victory there. And as you can see by the stats, yeah, I mean, we probably just shaded it. Just. Following our 1-0 win over Celtic, it was time for the League Cup final in which we managed to win 2-0 over Gretna. It only took 30 minutes for Cabral to open the scoring. Uh, Enzo scores and then doubled their advantage a few minutes later. Yaya missed yet another penalty, but... At the end of the day, it's the best time to miss it when you're 2-0 up, and we went on to win the League Cup. So, second time we won the League Cup in this save, and uh, yeah, brilliant. And also, just want to point out that in my very first season, so 10 years prior to this in-game, uh, we actually lost to Gretna in the Challenge Cup final. Was it on penalties or was it extra time? I don't remember. But this was a wee bit of revenge. This is a bigger cup, a uh, bigger stage, and we managed to... Uh, yeah, beat Gretna this time. Coincidentally, we were playing Gretna again uh, a few days later in the league. We managed a 4 0 win this time. A uh, bit more convincing. Yaya netted a double on 3 minutes and uh, 50 minutes. And uh, Enzo Scorza joined in in the act, scoring on 29 minutes and then on the hour mark for another clean sheet and another convincing 4 0 win. You have a look at this. The number of clean sheets is insane. Like, that's only two games where we've conceded goals since, like, January. Uh, this is like end of March. Uh, we got another clean sheet this time against Dunfermline. Uh, this was interesting because we actually went down to 10 men and Dunfermline missed a penalty. Lee Parker failed to convert. Uh, but the man who sent off, Adam Joyce, was the one who actually got the winning goal on 50 minutes prior to sending off. And ultimately we managed to hold out for a one win. And again, season-defining performance. Down to 10 men, up against a penalty, yet... You know, we managed to uh, pull off the win and get the three points and another clean sheet to go with it. So games were coming thick and fast at this point in the season and it was time for our quarter-final Champions League game. I don't want to say tie-over, but yeah, it was almost tie-over. Well, okay, there we go. Like, Fabregas went and got himself sent off. What more do I need to say? As you can see, Arsenal were rubbish. We had 20 shots on goal, 14 on target. They only had two, so even if they'd converted their two that they got on target, they would have still been creamed 6-2. They didn't even get an away goal, but that's probably the least of their worries. The fact they conceded six uh, was embarrassing enough. 
Uh, Cabral netted a, a goal in five minutes. Enzo scores a double their advantage on 25 minutes. Ashley Cole uh, helped us out with an own goal in 27 minutes. Uh, that made us 3 0 up at half time. Admittedly, Steve Curtis and Michael Dawson were both injured for them. Uh, however, Yaya then scored our fourth in 55, and Enzo scores a completed his hat trick with goals on 75 minutes and 82 minutes at the point where Arsenal were down to 10 men. So it was, in the end, a rout, and uh, that made it very difficult for them. Well, it goes without saying, it made it very difficult for them in the second leg. We had some Scottish Cup semi-final success with yet another clean sheet, this time against Livingston. Managed to get through to this, uh, well, our second National Cup final of the season. Yaya netted a hat-trick 33 minutes, 35 minutes and 69 minutes in front of a, a an attendance of 20,000. Managed to get through to the final and that's the main thing. Yaya scoring a hat-trick. So after getting through to the Scottish Cup final and after about six or seven clean sheets in a row, it was time for us to concede. Yeah, we lost 4-2 to Arsenal. At one point it looked like they were actually going to do it and... What goes around comes around. Look who scored against us. Martin Osborne. The player who I sold, he's actually out for two months, I just noticed. The player who I signed from Queen's Park for 60000 never played, sold to Livingston. He ends up becoming a superstar. He gets his big money moved to the Premier League. He's playing in a Champions League quarter final against the club who sold him. And he gets a goal. He might have won the battle, but he lost the war. Ha! Um, so yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> Well, Arsenal were kind of up against it from the very beginning because it was 6-0 in aggregate. Uh, Nathan Dykes then scored on 35 minutes to give, get us an away goal, meaning they would have to score 8. They had to score 8 goals to go through. Uh, it looked like they might do it, actually, because Fred scored in 40, uh, 40 minutes. Then uh, Osborne, who I just spoke about, netted right before half-time to make it 2-1. And then in the second half, uh, John O'Sullivan and Fred both got goals to make it 4-1. And I began to think to myself, could they do it? Four goals? Is is it still a big ask? Thankfully, though, uh, on 90 minutes, Antonio Brangan. Apologies for my pronunciation, but he uh, he scored an own goal in f uh, 90 minutes to make the score a bit more respectable, or less respectable for Arsenal. Whichever way you look at it. Anyway, 8-4 was the final result, and that sent us further in the Champions League than we'd ever been before uh, into the semi-finals. Following that, it was back to league duty, and back to Killy, where well, this was a home game against Killy, I should say, 2-0 victory, yet another own goal scored against us, Yaya opened the scoring after 52 minutes, finally breaking down the Killy defence, and then uh, one of the Killy players, whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce, netted uh, with 7 minutes remaining to give us the 3 points. Following the Killy game, we had a massive let-off against Livingston, this was the final game before the, the SPL split, and they outplayed us, they played us off the park Craig McBride opened the scoring on 14 minutes, they should have been like 10 nil up at half time, uh, out of nothing though Yaya managed to equalise for us on 28 minutes, and then at half time, Mark Kelly was sent off which put us in a very favourable position, despite being on the back foot for much of the game, David Mazio managed to score with 20 minutes remaining to get us an undeserved but very important three points. If we'd lost this game, it might have defined us as being second or third or even fourth place in the league, but we won it. We shouldn't have, but we did. Ultimately, it was important in the grand scheme of things. So I mentioned that the Livingston game was the last game before the split. Well, basically, it just so happened that the next game was the first game of the split, and it just so happened that Livingston were in the top six as well as us. And it just so happened that, oh, we had another away game against Livingston uh, just four days later, and oh yeah, look who comes and takes a revenge on us. Uh, so our first league defeat in a long, long time, our first failure to win a league game, I think 14 game winning, or 13 game winning streak, I don't remember, uh, was ended. Uh, Stephen Moran netted on, in the first minute, Yaya equalised on seven minutes, then they scored just before half time, and that was it, game over. GG, let's go home and focus on the next game. We made up for it in the next game. Haha, <laughs> not really. We lost 1 0 in the Champions League semi final to Bayern Munich. So we got drawn against Bayern Munich. The other tie was an all English affair Chelsea versus Man United. Chelsea actually won 6 0 in the first leg. After losing uh, 1 0 to a, a penalty after 17 minutes, I looked at the other score and thought, yep. Glad I'm not United. Glad I uh, I only lost one nil because I'm you know I'm still in the tie. That's the key thing in these two-legged games. You want to stay in the tie. Losing six nil, okay, you can win the next game six nil. 
but it's unlikely. But yeah, let's talk about Bayern. They were ruthless. Well, no, they weren't really, because they only scored one goal from 19 shots. We we played our part. You know, we could have scored as well. 10 shots, 7 on target is not bad. They've got some really good players. Schweinsteiger's 31 at this point in the game. Still got 17 pace. Incredible. There's Kevin Kuragi, who was born in Rio de Janeiro. Who's this? Aaron Hunt. That sounds like an English name. Uh, it doesn't have... He was born in, uh, in Germany. Doesn't look like he's got a second nationality. Some of these players are pretty good. Nuri Sahid, he's a real player. He was actually a really good player in this game. I think he starts off as like a youth player. But obviously he played for Real Madrid and Liverpool in real life, as well as Borussia Dortmund. Started his career at Dortmund and only recently made the move for £30.25 million to Bayern. Uh, Philippe Lamb is there at left-back. Good player, 32. Good player in real life and uh, obviously a good player in game. He's been at Bayern his whole career. There's Per Mertesacker at 31 years old. Still has no pace. Can mark, but he's in the starting lineup for whatever reason. So Michael Rensing, he is, uh, he's also a real player. Although probably not as well known. I don't know who he plays for now, but I just looked him up on Wikipedia. Uh, anyway, moving on. Oh yeah, actually, there's Di Michelis. I'm not sure if that's the Di Michelis, but he's 35. He's got no pace. Good stats though. Uh, good mentals. And that's all the real players I can recognise from that team. So yeah, that's the Bayern team. 1-0 defeat in uh, Germany. Now it's time for the biggest season-defining game of all. In theory, at this point, we could be knocked out of the Champions League, we could have lost the Scottish Cup final, and we could have lost the league and ended up with one trophy. But we didn't. We managed to beat Celtic and win the league. This was a game that won us the league. We went 12 clear of Celtic and they couldn't catch us after this. And as you can see, Juris Johansson was sent off after 23 minutes. Everything that could have gone wrong was going wrong. Think about it. We'd lost to Livingston and we'd let Celtic close the gap on us. We lost to Bayern in the first leg of the Champions League semi-final. And now Joris Johansson had got sent off in a game against Celtic, which they could easily win and go and, you know, close the gap to six points and make the title race interesting, which we didn't want. We don't want an interesting title race. We just want to win it and that's it. GG, see you later. Thankfully, though, we managed to hold out. Not just hold out, but we battered them. Well, we didn't really batter them. It's pretty even. But the point is, we got the all-important goal. Andy Jack with his only goal of the season. See, he, he was a one-goal season guy and his only goal was one of the most important. You know, it wasn't just like the fifth goal in a 5 0 win or the third goal in a 6 0 win. It was the only goal in a 1 0 win and it won us the league title. So we managed to win the league with three games remaining and that meant we could take our foot off of the gas. And let me tell you, the players definitely did take their feet off the gas, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but it was time for our return leg against Bayern. And it was 1-0. We managed to win 1-0. We absolutely battered them. And then we managed to win on penalties. Uh, ignore these penalties. Basically, I, I've spoken about the penalty glitch before. Sometimes it messes up the penalties. And if you win a penalty shootout, the other team wins or something stupid like that. But another way this glitch manifests itself is when it reorders the penalty takers on who scored and who did score. For example, um, let me think. What was the final score? I think it was 3-1 to us. Or 4-1 toss was the final score. Anyway, who cares about penalties? Brian Nelson scored his only goal of the season. Again, remember last game? Andy Jack scored his only goal in a 1-0 win. Brian Nelson got his only goal in this win. And honestly, it would have been a travesty if we'd lost. Because Bayern were rubbish. Look at that. 22 shots from us. 14 on target. 57% ball possession. We completely trounced them. Should have been like 12-0 up. Unfortunately, we only won 1-0. Had we lost in penalties, it would have been sore to take. But, thankfully, we managed to uh, we managed to win. In fact, I remember taking off uh, a defensive midfielder and putting Anderson on just so he could take a penalty. And uh, who took the penalties for me? I think it was Kevin Roberts definitely took one. Anderson definitely took one. Yaya definitely took one. And I think Nick Hill took, uh, scored the most important one. So basically these four players scored. The first one, sorry, scored for Bayern. And then the, and then the last three missed. So it worked out in our favour very well. And that, as you will know, took us to our very first Champions League final. Ten seasons on. Think about this. Ten years on from being in the first division. We were now in the Champions League final. And we were against Chelsea, who just thrashed Man United. I don't even know what the final score was in the second leg. I wasn't worried about that. I was just hyped at being in a Champions League final. Never been that far in the competition before. But we couldn't think about that yet, because we had a, a league game to play. 2-2 uh, draw against Aberdeen. Pretty meaningless, but we were 2-0 down. And I was like, rats, this is going to be bad for morale. Thankfully, Yaya scored in 77 minutes, and Richard Thornton equalised on 82 minutes uh, to 
restore some pride and obviously to come back from two down to get a point. We then matched that score against Kilmarnock, conceding two goals for the second game running. Um, this time, Ryan Walker opened the scoring in 22 minutes. Craig Baird scored a penalty for Kilmarnock. Yaya scored what looked like a winner with three minutes to go, but then uh, Brian Hart uh, equalised for Kilmarnock with the last kick of the game. I think the sorest thing was that four, four of my players picked up injuries after this game. So, as you can see, it only mentions Colin Bell, but as you can see, Neil Campbell picked up a knock, Richard Thornton picked up a knock, and Yaya also picked up a knock. So that was four players, all of whom were out injured. Thankfully, Yaya and Richard Thornton were only out for like a week, so they'd be able to play in the Scottish Cup final and the Champions League final. But Neil Campbell and Colin Bell were out for the season. And then I was worried that if we got trounced by Rangers in our last game of the season, our morale would just plummet. Because that's generally what happens. You know, we might have won 14 games in a row, but as soon as we lost, the morale went from superb to, like, very poor. It was awful. But thankfully, uh, we went 3-0 up against Rangers after 55 minutes. David Gross and Ryan Walker both scored. 14 minutes, 32 minutes. And then after half time, on 55 minutes. And thankfully... That was all it needed, and we fought off a Rangers fight back, although they gave it a good go. And we managed to win our final game of our league-winning season. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that um, twice I had to send Enzo scores on holiday because he'd been playing a lot for Uruguay, he'd obviously been travelling a lot, and he often needed to be sent on holiday in order to rest him a bit, because... Yeah, he, there's this thing that comes up where it says a player's jaded and in need of a rest because they've played too many games. So I'm surprised it didn't happen to more players because some players were playing stupid amounts of games throughout the season. Uh, but anyway, so he was on holiday at this point as well. I had to call him back for the Scottish Cup final, which is up next. Uh, I actually, I chose not to play, was it Thornton and Yaya who were both injured against Kilmarnock? I chose not to play them. I played not a weakened team. I wouldn't say I had a weakened team because all my players were that good, but... I didn't play my first choice team, put it that way, but we still managed to beat Partick Thistle 5-0 at Hampden Park. Uh, made easier by the fact they got someone sent off, and made easier by the fact they are a lower division team. In fact, the morale was pretty poor. It still is poor, but that's presumably because they got thrashed 5-0 by us. Uh, but as you can see, they, uh, they lost their last game of the season, and so missed out on the promotion spot in the first division. Richard Thornton broke down their resistance on 28 minutes um, and it was 1-0 at half time. Uh, Cabral then made it 2-0 before Andrew Evans was sent off. Ryan Walker scored from the resulting penalty to make it 3-0. He then scored another penalty on 64 and he completed his, uh, completed his hat-trick on 90 minutes to make it 5-0 and to get my second Scottish Cup which is quite fantastic. I was happy with that. A domestic treble. I fully expected to lose to Chelsea because we don't have the two-legged tie, obviously. It's it's all about the one game. I'm actually going here to see when I last won the Scottish Cup. I think, yeah, it was second season. Oh, look, actually, uh, I lost the final. Oh, Jigs, I forgot about that. Was that the season that I won the league or was that the season before I won the league? I don't remember. Anyway, so it's been almost 10 years since I last won the Scottish Cup. So it was nice to uh, win it again. In fact, last time I won the Scottish Cup, it was against lower league opposition as well. I mean, you've got to beat them, though. Partick beat Rangers. Rangers could beat lower league opposition, so yeah. And finally, at the conclusion of the season, our season had lasted a long, long, long time. We'd made it to the pinnacle of club football. I don't know how to present this. Chelsea were rubbish. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. They were rubbish. Either that or we were just really, really good. As you can see, 13 shots on target... It could have been way more than 6-2. Admittedly, they had 8 shots on target and scored 2 goals. So this has to be one of the best Champions League finals in this game, of course. not in, It's obviously not real life, and I'm sure other people have had better Champions League finals. As you can see, it was played in Rotterdam. 51,000 attended. I'll be honest, did I enjoy it? Did I relish it? Did I appreciate it? Well, not really. And I'll tell you why. It's because I'd been playing the game for like over... Around 12 hours, basically, I played so much games, so many games, that this was like the end of a draining session where my tension had been rising and rising and rising and rising. And then, as soon as we won the Scottish Cup, all that tension just released, because we'd done it. We'd won the treble. There was no way I was going to beat Chelsea. And then, indeed, Chelsea took the lead on four minutes through Matinho. And I thought to myself, if this game ends 1-0, I'm going to be kicking myself. I remember a few years ago, got knocked out in the Champions League quarterfinal because we lost 1-0 on aggregate to Juventus, albeit Buffon was playing and he was a good goalkeeper, or he is a good goalkeeper. 
But if this ended 1-0, it would have been really annoying. Thankfully, it only took 8 minutes for that possibility to be eliminated. Gary Stewart equalised for us on 12 minutes. And then Chelsea just capitulated. Cabral made it 2-1 two, two, on 29 minutes. Yaya made it 3-1 on 31 minutes. And then Cabral put it out of sight just before half-time. At that point, I was I couldn't believe myself. I thought this will be the biggest comeback of all time if Chelsea net 4 in the second half. But they were just... They just they didn't come out at all. I mean, they did get chances, but we always seem to be overpowering them. And uh, Enzo scores, I mean, it's 5-1 uh, in the 77th minute. Luis Rafael then netted in 84 minutes. And then Jeremy Defoe managed to get a consolation, a late consolation for Chelsea. But ultimately, we ran out 6-2 winners to be crowned champions of Europe. 6-2 winners over Chelsea. Let's, I'll, I'll briefly show the Chelsea team. Um, Michael Chopra was playing for them. He's an interesting player. Jeremy Defoe, obviously. Uh, a legend in the Premier League. Oh, maybe not a legend, but an I iconic player from the Premier League. Ian Robin, now 32, playing on the left. Still with 17 pace. Joe Cole was playing on the right. Out of position, may I add. Uh, Michael Essien is still playing. Through the middle. Joey Matinho. These players are far, far better than our players. How did they not score more than two goals? How did they not prevent us from scoring six? Uh, there's Giorgio Chiellini. Tom Huddleston playing at centre-back. He's obviously good at this game. Peter Cech's playing as well. Uh, I don't recognise the other two players. If we have a look at their subs bench, John Terry came off the bench. I, I, I noticed that with his eight pace. Uh, Solomon Kalou came off the bench. That's interesting. He played. He didn't play for them at the start of the game. He signed for them later on. That's quite funny, actually. Is that Lucas the Liverpool Lucas? Could be. He obviously didn't play for Liverpool in this game. Um, Vincent Company's there on the bench. Who did he start out with in this game? Anderlecht. Then he moved on to Chelsea and Steve McKenzie. Who, is he in my Scotland squad? Yeah, but he didn't play. He didn't play any part of the final. Although, maybe he should have. Because look at that. Look at those ratings. 4-3-4-5-4 four, four, four for the Chelsea defence. Look at our ratings. So 8s, 9s, 10s. Adam Joyce, the only reason Adam Joyce got a six was because he was at fault for the second Chelsea goal, but who cares? So that brought to an end probably the greatest season I've ever had or, or will ever have on Football Manager. I will be stunned if I can top this ever in future. We play football that was out of this world. Really, really good expansive stuff. Again, props to Dan or whoever it is that made this tactic. Props because it works really, really well. If you've got the right players... And if you've got good morale, because remember, we had good morale, you know, winning breeds good morale, and as a result, we just kept on winning and winning and winning until, well, we ended up with four trophies in the cabinet. Oh yeah, actually, as a result of all that, let's have a look at the Hall of Fame, because I've actually, I'm up to fourth now, just behind Jock Steen and uh, Bill Struth and Willie Mealy. This is the Nation Hall of Fame, so managing in Scotland. Obviously Alex Ferguson would be higher, but he only managed Aberdeen in Scotland. Well, he managed more. He managed St Mirren and East Stirling and all that, but he only really won trophies with uh, Aberdeen. So he's down at ninth. If you have a look at nationality, Alex Ferguson's at the top, obviously, because it's counting his Man United trophies. And I'm up there in fifth place. I'm actually up there in fifth place, and I'm also down there in ninth place. <laughs> but that was my uh, World Cup win with England in, the, in my James's World Cup John series. In terms of our continental reputation, as you can see, we are just six points behind 20th position, and we're just 32 points behind Johan Croy for the worldwide one. So, will we ever catch up? Hopefully, but I mean, keep in mind, it's taken me 10 years to get this far, so who knows, it might take me another 10 or 20 years to get any more if I last that long. Anyway, let's have a look at finances. As you can see, if you go to my homepage, you'll be able to see here that my balance is all the way up at 22 million. I'm interested to see what my transfer budget for next season will be. Um, I'm not sure if I'll actually make any signings though. I'm not sure. Like, why would I make any signings? Why would I? I mean, obviously you need to fresh the team up, but a lot of these players are young and hungry and hopefully they can improve. I've, I've only got one player that's over 30, I think. Okay, I've only got two players that are um, the other side of 30, but I mean, still, I, I don't feel I need to make any signings. Maybe some youth players to bolster the team, but apart from that, I'll probably just put all my money into the wage budget and offer some of these players new contracts. With that all said and done, let's have a look at the Scotland games now. So, Scotland's an interesting one. Obviously, 
I won the World Cup and as a result I was in the Confederations Cup. So I'm going to show you how I did in that now. After that I'll show you how we did in European qualification. Uh, you probably saw how we did um, because I, I've shown my home screen a million times. So we were in a Confederations Cup group. It was actually held in Canada. We are in a group with Canada, the hosts, uh, Nigeria and Argentina, who of course we'd beat on our way to winning the World Cup. Game against Canada, probably should have done a bit better, but Ryan Wilkie got the all-important goal in 26 minutes to get us off to a winning start. Three points in the first game. Then, in order to prove that our World Cup win was no fluke, we managed to beat Argentina 2-1. Goals from Craig Beatty and an Oscar Ustari own goal after 64 minutes put us 2-0 up. Carlos Fernandez then managed to score in 86 minutes to pull one back, but it was too little too late and it's the first time in Football Manager that I've played against Messi. Well, first time I remember playing against Messi. As you can see, Messi's finally been called up. He's not amazing in this game, because this was obviously before he was high profile. This was the 2005-06 season. Uh, it starts him off in Barcelona C, I think. James, he actually moves to Man United pretty quickly at the start of this game. Uh, but yeah, oh, it'd be so cool to sign him, wouldn't it? Maybe if, I, maybe if I get enough transfer budget together, I can sign Messi. That'd be pretty cool. The thing is, though, like, who would he replace? Like, he can't even play... You know, he can play in attacking midfield. So he's going to have to replace Cabral. Is he really better than Cabral, though? Right, let's see. Cabral versus Lionel Messi. Eh, they're about even. Yeah, see, they're about even. So, I mean, it's six and a half a dozen. All right, so anyway, there you go. We, we played against uh, Lionel Messi. Um... And, but we managed to beat him and get a 2-1 win, not just him, but Argentina as well. There we go, so that basically put us through to the next round of the tournament. But we still had one group game left to go, of course. And that group game was against Nigeria. As you can see, they opened the scoring on 19 minutes. Um, we needed at least a point to finish top of the group. Thankfully, Craig Hall equalised for us on 63 minutes. I think Chris Boyd, who was absolutely garbage. Like The reason I called him up was because he played with Ipswich and got like 20 goals in the championship. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll call him up. I've not called him up before. Uh, he was rubbish. He missed so many chances. Finally, he got a goal on 83 minutes uh, to give us a 2-1 victory at the Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton. That sent us through with maximum points to the semi-finals. So basically the format is two groups of four, top two go through to the semi-finals, and then the winner, the winners of those go through to the final. And unfortunately, we choked at the semi-final stage, as you can see, uh, Quavis Kirk scored after 10 minutes, and America basically just defended for the rest of the game. And that was game over. Yeah, not much happened after that. They actually have a really, really good team. I mean, Freddie Ad uh, Adu, need I say more? He's, uh, he's really good at this game. This was obviously, this game came out when he was like uh, 14 or something, heralded as a big, big prospect. Uh, and he's he's got good stats, but it's not just him. Like, they got this guy Jimenez who plays for Colorado. Yeah, he's really good. Got some really, really good players. Okay, maybe not that guy. But the point is, there, there are no slouches. Jonathan Spector, who used to play for uh, Manchester United, he's alright. So, the point is, they were about equal with us. Maybe slightly better, slightly worse, something like that. So, unfortunately, we were out of the Confederations Cup. However, there was still a third-place playoff to play in order to get the bronze medal. And... Take a guess at who we played. Yep, that's right. We made it three wins out of three against Argentina to prove that the last two were not flukes. Albeit this one was probably the easiest. Colacini was sent off after 15 minutes. Ryan Wilkie netted on 16 minutes. And then 79 minutes uh, saw Chris Boyd make it 2-0. And we managed to beat Messi and co for the second game running. I don't know why they're playing Messi out of position. Like, the AI on this game is sometimes really daft. Anyway, that was a bit of a bittersweet moment as we managed to get a bronze medal from the Confederations Cup. Obviously, it would have been nice to win. I think I'm, I'm more disappointed because waiting in the final was Germany. So I'm more disappointed in the fact I never got to play Germany than... You know, obviously I didn't win it. Anyway, moving on. Let's have a look at our European qualification uh, games. I actually missed out one of them. Uh, before the Confederations Cup was played, we actually beat Switzerland 2-0. So we got a bit of revenge on them because they beat us 2-1 at Hamden. Gary O'Connor scored both the goals. James McFadden missed a penalty because, you know, people like to miss penalties when they're playing for me. Uh, but Gary O'Connor scored in 33 minutes and on 75 minutes. They were down to 10 minutes after 15 minutes, so that probably helped us quite a bit. Then, best result of the qualification stage, we managed to beat the Netherlands, uh, Netherlands sorry, 2-0. 
Gary Brown opened the scoring on 58 minutes. James McFadden scored on 77 minutes. And then Darren McDowell, sc uh, sorry, he didn't score. He missed a penalty on 90 minutes because that's just the done thing. You know, it, it would be a win without a bit of a penalty miss. Uh, again, the Netherlands went down to 10 men, which obviously helped us out. But as you can see, they had some decent players. Ian Robbins there. Uh, who else? Nigel De Jong playing at centre back. Uh, Voss, he's all right. Heitinger, he's a lot better. Stecklenburg in goal. And this guy, Collins John, I actually have for St Johnston in my 2011 save, uh, which you can find in the playlist of my season highlights. And you'll find that this guy actually plays for me in 2011. Following that win over Holland, we went away and beat San Marino 5-0. Uh, Gary Stewart netted on 21 minutes and then Gary O'Connor just went ahead and netted four goals. 32 minutes, 34 minutes, 57 minutes and 64 minutes were the times in which Gary O'Connor scored four goals against San Marino and that put us in a really, really strong position. I think we were top of the league by about two points, three points maybe. Um, so we were in a pretty strong position and then for the final game uh, against Georgia, we had to uh, win in order to qualify because there was still two games to go. However, so Georgia had two games. If they won and then won their next game, they would finish above us, basically. So we had to win to stop that from happening. Thankfully, Gary O'Connor netted on eight minutes and John Donnelly netted on 58 minutes to get us a 2-0 win. So let's have a look at Gary O'Connor. 79 caps, 43 goals is really, really good. He will definitely be going to the Euros for us. Um, let's have a quick look. Okay, so here's my Confederations group, if we could just go back to the proper year. That was my Confederations Cup group. As you can see, we finished top on nine points. Uh, Canada beat Nigeria, I think. They finished on three points. Argentina qualified for the second round as well on six points. Should probably show that off earlier. Uh, but this was our European Championship qualification group. As you can see, uh, we finished three points clear of the Netherlands, who went through anyway, although they had to go through via a playoff. Switzerland finished on 11 points. Georgia lost their last two games, which meant they finished second bottom. And of course, San Marino classically managed to beat Sweden, eh, Switzerland, sorry, eh, when we beat Georgia. So they finished on four points. Fair play to them. And so what that means is we're going to have another live session. I'm going to hopefully record the European Championships live, like I did with the World Cup. And uh, hopefully we can do well. I mean, of course, we won the World Cup, so that's heightened expectations, uh, personal expectations, I should say. That The bookies still have us at, like, 50 to 1 to win, so they clearly haven't learned anything. But as you can see, let's have a look at the World Cup. Oh, look at that, we're fifth! Chings, I took a screenshot uh, to basically show you that we'd gone above 8th uh, place or something like that. We were in 7th or something. But look at that, I don't need to show it because we got 5th. I've not really checked this throughout the year, to be honest, so we may well have gone above 5th, but it's epic to witness us at 5th place. That's the thing, in this version it doesn't tell you when the rankings are updated, so you never know, so you have to always go and manually check it. But as you can see, we're above England, only the Netherlands, who we beat, Argentina, who we've beaten three times, and Brazil, who we drew with, are above us. We've not played Germany yet, which, much to my regret, but maybe we'll play them at the European Championships. So I've already been on the screen, I've already shown you who's in my group for the European Championships. As you can see, we've got Belgium, Northern Ireland and Norway. It's a, an interesting group. Put it this way, we could get knocked out, but we could go through it. We've got a good chance of going through it, put it that way. Uh, if we have a look at the rest of the groups, if I can find them, there we go. So, Germany didn't qualify. I just noticed. Um, we've got Portugal, Netherlands and France in this group of death along with Albania. We've got England, Finland, Hungary and Slovenia in a pretty interesting group. There's our group there uh, that I've just read out. And then Denmark, Iceland, Romania and Spain. That's a group that's obviously linked with our group in terms of who plays who in the quarterfinals. Of course, this is Euro 2016. In real life, Euro 2016 had 24. How many teams did it have again? I think it was 24 teams it had in real life. But because this game came out in 2000. And five when there was still 16 teams in the Euros that's why it doesn't have the 24 team setup and it's got the classic setup so yeah just so I point that out um I don't think I've ever actually managed a team at the Euros before so it's going to be a an interesting experience how will it go not really sure as I said I'd be I'd be happy to get out the group anything after that would be a bonus not to finish last would be a bonus but again keep in mind where I'm coming from if Scott ever qualified for a major tournament it would be unbelievable. And even if we got stuffed in every group, group game, we wouldn't care. So, yeah. There's still a chance we can qualify for Euro 2020 in real life. So, watch this space. But 
I guess I'll just have to enjoy the virtual reality of uh, Scotland qualifying for tournaments. And who knows, maybe we'll win it as we won the World Cup. Unlikely, but you never know. Also, I just want to point out that we only beat one European team on our way to winning the World Cup. Wales, in the last 16, was the only European team we beat, which I found fascinating. All the other teams came from other continents, obviously. So I've continued the game, um, and here we've got the Champions League awards. As you can see, Jonas Johansson managed to win the Champions League Best Player after, I think he came second or third last season. Um, as you can see, Jeremy Defoe won the Golden Boot with 12 goals. Not sure how many Carabao got. He got nine. And then there's a dream team. Five of my players got through. Uh, the goalkeeper Tolich, uh, Dykes got in, Johansson got in, as did the striking partnership of Yaya and Gary Stewart, which was obviously never a striking partnership. Gary Stewart played on the left. And uh, yeah, we'll be on to next time, I guess. Do I expect to do as well next time? Well, I mean, it'd be nice to, but I think this is one of a kind. I don't think we could expect this to happen next season, although unfortunately I feel like the board's expectations will just go through the roof. That tends to happen. But yeah, still a world-class manager. Oh yeah, actually, St. Johnston, are they? Surely they're continental now. Oh, look at that. Look at that. We're continental now. Finally, finally, we're able to attract big, big names. It'll be interesting to see how we've done in, in the European rankings and all that. Like, how, how high will we go as a result of that? I know this video's gone on a long time, but I just thought I would say that they don't actually count the League Cup. Because look at that, they got double. This was after winning the uh, the Scottish Cup, so I've won the double. But obviously, we all know that the Scottish Cup completed the domestic treble. And uh, then after the Champions League, in which we got, look at that, 4.5 million for winning the Champions League final, 1.9 million for uh, revenue. That obviously took us way above the uh, 20 million mark for the balance. But then look at this, famous treble. I mean, obviously, we all know that the real treble is the domestic cup, the league, and the... Uh, Champions League, but come on, surely you've got to recognise the quadruple part of it. Anyway, whatever. Well, that'll bring it to, that'll bring this video, this long video, to an end. I'm going to have to edit this down somehow. Can't wait for that. But yeah, next video will be my live reactions to my, how, well, how Scotland do the European Championships. And then the video after that, it'll be back for next season. Even if we win one trophy next season, I think we've done well. But the fact we've won four in one season is unbelievable. I know I said winning the World Cup was my greatest achievement in Football Manager. Well, you know, winning the quadruple has to be up there as well. It's difficult to choose. Thank you very much for checking out this video. Uh, all the very best to you. And I'll see you when I see you.